Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, the title of the talk is Our Life's Purpose is to Experience the Eternity of Life Itself. And this morning, um, Sheikh Fadlala Hairi did say that our purpose in life is but to worship the purpose of life for man and the invisible entities is to worship the one. And the deeper level of meaning in that is that worship engenders that total devotion and love, almost an obsession to pursue, pursue the one that is the source behind all creation, all universes, all life itself, life itself. Before we start that, I wanted to share some observations recently about the entire journey of enlightenment. This has been a hot, popular talk for the last several, in recent years, in the West in particular, where the pursuit for illumined living, for experiencing and witnessing a more true level of what life is about and what the world outside us is like, that has set upon popular media, groups and organizations, and individuals to become so obsessed with the idea of enlightenment that many dropped all their earthly belongings in pursuit of this quest. And so it has become, over the years, um, a monumental idea that enlightenment is something that we can go after and attain. What has also happened during these years, um, since the rise of the, the, the pursuit of higher consciousness in the 70s and 80s, is an understanding that, in fact, all the secrets that many of us were in pursuit of now exist in books. They exist on YouTube. They exist on CDs and DVDs. And the menu, the menu for the thirsty ones is already available. So, so the uh, impetus now is the direct experience or eating the meal that's promised on the menu. So what is this direct experience um, of enlightenment? In the, in the teachings that have been shared in this community has been the knowledge that we are already illumined within. And the, the soul is light. Our individual soul is nothing other than just a spark from the great flame of the one eternal, infinite light that we tend to call reality or God. So if the light is already there, what prevents us from feeling it, seeing it, and sensing it? We are, well, the answer becomes obvious, self-evident, when we recognize that living in this world, what seems to be our primary impetus is survival. Survival for body, shelter, safety, security, um, a sense of belonging and love. Um, and all of that gives rise to our first instinctual response whenever confronted with any moment um, in, in our personal um, uh, existence to protect the self. And as we mature and grow, we learn through experience that no matter how much you protect yourself, you never feel safe no matter how much you think you preserve your energy, your wealth, your possessions, um, there's still that anxiety um, that when will the next window open that threatens the loss of all of this. So through experience itself, which is part of the mercy of this universe, we then turn to recognize that no matter what we do to try to self-master our own thinking, our own goals and desires, and also to control our outer existence uh, becomes impossible. And, and with that, we begin to turn inward. 
And by turning inward, um, we recognize that there are moments almost non-voluntary. It happens by itself. It comes upon us when we have a glimpse of what it feels like to feel peace. And I don't know. It's, it comes in many different forms. Everyone has their own journey. And sometimes it's, you know, holding your infant babe that you just gave birth to and looking at it and thinking, how could I... How is it possible, possible to ever love something so much? Or it might be um, with a group of friends and you're taking a lovely stroll in the evening along the lake and suddenly the light hits the water in a certain way that you see the green on top of the horizon that turns to gold when the sun goes down. They call it the emerald light. And you look at that and you say, now where did that come from? You know, I've never seen it all my life and tonight I'm feeling so content with my friends, and I see that. Or you're with a loved one, and you lose yourself in the other. So there are many ways that life conspires to bring us to points of tasting that contentment and calm. So we recognize that we're not just this body that's concerned about survival, but there is something else within that balances that, and that is the spirit that seems in those precious moments to override what we um, normally ascribe to our own identity in this world. No, I'm not the body, I'm not my thoughts. Where did this thought come from? I'm not my emotions, where did the peace come from? So it opens yet windows and windows and windows. And then the more we allow and trust those openings, the more frequently they come, and the, and the deeper they also um, uh, are experienced, because nature is very economical. It never repeats itself twice. And this is um, why on the um, a spiritual path, when someone has a vision of the prophet or of the angels or some great mystical experience, they want it again, and it never, ever, it never, ever happens in the same way twice. Um, so, divine presence, spirit, life, God, the reality, is never absent. We are absent, it's never absent. In fact, there is nothing, um, uh, we are taught, in fact, even before we believe it, um, as children, we're taught to say that there is no God but God, which means there is nothing other than God, which means there is only God. So on the ultimate level of our spiritual commitment, even without tasting it or experiencing it, we are being conditioned to be open to the fact that there is only divine presence. And that is what is meant by your soul is already illumined, but that we're already um, enlightened. But we ourselves are the ones who 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 block the experience of living in the light. So what I wanted to do today is to also um, acknowledge um, a master whom I've learned deeply from, um, and that is um, Mullah Sadra, Sadr al-Din al-Shirazi, passed away too long ago, but left an extraordinary teaching uh, many writings about the journey through this life from self to soul or from you to God, using that metaphor of language in medieval times. And so I often say that the longest journey in this life, you know, is not the trip from Brooklyn to Manhattan, but it's really from self to soul. <laughs> and what does that mean? The first journey is simply recognizing that this world will never give you what you seek. So we, so we turn away from that and metaphorically open up to um, recognizing the one, the real God. And from there, it is so intoxicating and so absorbing. Um, it, 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 it grips you in such a way that um, everything is so beautiful, you really don't want to, to leave that... Um, that aura, that atmosphere. Um, 
but stay, but to to only bask in that generosity and love and grace um, is not acknowledging your debt to the Creator who gave you this life and gave you gave you the journey to discover it. Um, so we return back to the world that you came from. It is a hero's journey, by the way. We, we return to our humble origins, and in our own simple way, we share what we have learned. And so we call that the fourth journey, service through the mercy of God into the world. That's the fourth journey. And that's what I'd like to share with um, all of us today. Um, where are the forms? Okay. So, uh, bef- I can go down oh, no, uh, I think I gave it to Mohammed. Oh, sorry. Sorry. They all, they all have that. Yeah. So, um, I want us to uh, please, please share if you can. They may not be. Um, I'd like everyone to look at this flower. All right. And, um, Tell yourself what you see. Not, not to us, just tell your own self what it is you see. And reflect on what you are telling yourself. Okay. Great. So on the, sorry, that this was just for you. Now, Sheikh Fadlala gave us a map called the three C's. And um, the three C's stand for connectivity, continuity, and consciousness. And I'm going to use this map, because it's worked for me very well, to, to see if we can all invite our own selves into a taste of that, that, that direct experience of what it is to feel something fall away um, and maybe another reflection to take it to emerge. In other words, removing blocks. Because the only work really in the fourth journey or in um, the quest for recognizing your own illumination is to remove all the barriers that are in the way. And the barriers can be thoughts, the barriers can be fears, anxieties, anything that we feel has held us back in life. So if you um, look at the sheet, what um, we have here is a brief definition of the three C's. The first one being connectedness. Connectedness being a feeling of belonging to or having affinity with a particular person, thing, or group. By thing, we might even say the cosmos, a god, or a friend. Um, And there are a a few questions under each title. And the questions are there just as triggers to open up what might be, at the moment, important to you, or might be something that could be very useful in dealing with your own relationship, or maybe feeling, why am I holding myself back when I know it's, it's simple just to relinquish some ideas I've had that no longer work for me, and what could then emerge to help me see the world in a whole different way, and myself and the other in a different way. Um, You can give rise to your own questions under each of the topics. Um, So another question could be, what is my connection to the world around me? What are my tools to stay spiritually connected? And then on a more personal, direct level, when, am, when I am with, and you fill in the blank, you know, husband, daughter, child, friend, teacher, mentor, the silence is never awkward. Who is it that when you are in their company, you can sit in contented silence? It's never an awkward situation. Um, So this is really just for you to begin to explore your own connectedness to self, other, and to God. Um, The second question is continuity. Continuity is the quality of something that does not stop or change as time passes. 
Uh, continuity means preserving a consistent whole. So again, it is what Sheikh Fadlala alluded to this morning. How do we stay? Uh, how, uh, what you know? What what is the means by which our continuity with the One remains preserved and whole? That's my words here. Um, so you can ask yourself: Consider a time when you experienced flow. I think many of you, especially who are athletic or intense in achievement, which is a can be a very good thing, knows what the flow is. Yes, it's 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 when. It's when your inner takes over and the cognitive side of you that knows the rules and the do's and don'ts disappears. And suddenly you find yourself in flight. You find yourself in motion. You find yourself doing things that you may have never done before at an excellent level. It's called flow. And flow is a form of surrender um, without intention. You know, you simply want to run the marathon. Um, or in my case, um, you know, playing a game with one of the children who are very, very smart. And I don't know what happened. I never played that game before, but suddenly I was, you know, I won. And I don't know how it happened. And nobody knew how it happened. But I, I recognized if I try, I could never, you know, beat the young boy. So I, I just said, well, it's already de facto, it's done. And suddenly I won. So something happens when we let go of the idea of how to pursue an outer goal or intention. Um, another question could be, what works for you, for me, when I wish to clock out of time? What tool do I use to access timelessness? You know, when the day becomes just too strategic and too intense, you sometimes want to turn it all off. What do you do to achieve that? And if something works for you and you keep doing it on a daily basis, you'll create your own neural network, a, a neural pathway, so that you can almost only think it and suddenly you're in timelessness. And the third C being consciousness, it's generally um, um, the experts in the field of consciousness, which might be the uh, most significant topic in both spiritual and physical, quantum physics uh, universes today, um, is the inability to actually define it. You ask even the experts, they say, well, we really can't define it, but this is what we say. So this is what they say. It's a state or quality of awareness. So to be fully conscious, conscious is a, is a little different from awareness. You can be aware of something, but if you're conscious and you're full and attentive to it, it will open up something, a deeper understanding of something that's external or within yourself. There is nothing we know more intimately than conscious experience. And in fact, when you reflect on it, the only thing we can really say that we have or we know is our consciousness. You know, when we're asleep, we have no idea what, if the universe is still there. Isn't it? I mean, we assume because we trust, but it's blind faith. We don't know. It may not be there when you wake up. Um, so I'm beginning to see, uh, because consciousness to me is the key to everything, your life and, and life out there, which is inseparable. Um, so consciousness um, is actually experience. I mean, you cannot speak about consciousness without experience. If you're not aware, then there's no experience, no event, nothing happening. So you see how important this idea of um, your own illumination, your own enlightenment, uh, um, the necessity of it to be experienced. So I want to just have this session not be about language or words, but to start to give a feeling of how you experience your own consciousness. Therefore, the questions. So here are a few questions. How important is peace within you to you? I don't like to use inner peace because that's been used in too many a film. <laughs> but how important is peace, your inner peace, to yourself? What would you give up, if anything, to remain in a state of inner peace? I mean, it's a real question. 
And, and, you know, every day when life gets hectic, we know we can go into timelessness and peace. So what do we choose to do? Um, another question, why would I give up something that I loved and wanted to keep? What would make me give up something that I loved and wanted to keep? And often as a spiritual practice, you're told to give away something, particularly if you're attached to it. And I'm thinking, for example, in the Quran and in the Bible, where Ibrahim, Abraham the prophet, um, was instructed by his Lord to give up his son by sacrifice. So it, so it is deep, but for me it might simply be a blouse that I really liked. And what would enable me to give this up when I wanted to keep it? So I have to really self-reflect on, on what things mean to me and what does it do to me. It doesn't mean you can't have beautiful clothes. This is not the point of the exercise. I mean, Suleiman was the richest, wealthiest man in the universe, at his, in the world at his, uh, during his lifetime, and became a great prophet. So it's not about what you own, but it's about what doesn't own you. you See, so you can have things, but it doesn't define you. And if the things disappear, you're not diminished at all by it. This is the state of illumination. Okay, another question. Many of us long to be able to have unconditional love for others. Is unconditional love possible in this life? You know, we talk about it as though, yeah, we're going to aspire to that and arrive. Is it, ever, is it even possible in this life? Maybe, yes. I mean, it's for each of us to answer. And if it were not possible, why are we striving for it? So where is that you know, inner engine of motivation sitting? Is it the soul that's crying out for perfection? Anyway, these are, you can have your own questions, but these are just a few that um, I wanted to share with you. And in closing, um, I'm always taken aback as though I hear it for the first time. Um, when um, Sheikh Fadlala keeps saying, you know, you don't exist, um, there's only the one. But then he'll always follow up by saying, if I stub your toe, are you going to scream? And so that's very, very important um, when listening or reading um, a spiritual wisdom um, is to take the whole cosmology before just latching onto something that really is a good soundbite. Um, and um, Ibn Arabi for once said, if your vision of God, of Allah, of God, does not contain yourself within it, then it's not a complete vision because uh, we are put in this world for a reason. So we cannot deny the space-time universe which is our body. It, it, it is there for a purpose as well. Um, and I, uh, I just want to really thank um, everybody I've met in my life um, because I've learned, I've learned something from almost every single person I've met. And um, so everything becomes a teaching and then you simply, nobody can teach, but you can receive teaching and you can pass it on. But no, you can't do anything really, even for yourself. You can't even do it for yourself. The only thing you can do, only thing you really have control over, if you want to say that, is your own thinking. So when you decide, and thinking is a root of, is, is, is an, a branch of con a consciousness. So you see how it all ties back as us being conscious beings. And um, in closing, I allude to this concept of surrender because it is equally prominent in any discussion about spirituality and enlightenment. It is not possible to, for you or, or me or anyone to surrender. It is not possible to surrender. What happens, surrender, ha which is why the Sufi mystics always say that um, um, you can crawl on your hands and knees you know, to the cave of wisdom, climb up a mountain. Um, you can knock on the door relentlessly, but it may not open. 
because we cannot control, even by volition and will and intent, the experience of surrender. Surrender is a doorway. And so what is it that we do then to um, surrender the barriers and the blocks? What is it we do? What we do is we do all the work, all the work of fourth journey stuff, you know, clearing blocks, um, making amends, asking forgiveness, being generous, serving the community. We do all the work that begins to diminish our own self-concerns. And something happens that it's, you can't even describe. You can't even explain how it happens, but suddenly that shift is um, beyond space and time. You, you cannot say, in one second I was here, and in another, another second this thing opened up. It's, it's, it's suddenly there which means it's so present, you know? Someone says there's longing to be known. Um, so about, about, um, about surrender, this is again part of a very loaded language, which maybe it's best to let go of, um, and to just go about our duties following the divine attributes, you know, of friendship, kindness, um, helpfulness, service, um, learning, teaching, um, sharing, um, and in, in the process of putting out, putting, putting yourself out um, and by the, uh, by the side and putting yourself away for a while, then the grace and the baraka can descend. Okay, thank you. <laughs>